Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 2 on my series on the psychology of language. Now as I had explained before in my first class, the idea behind floating a course on the psychology of language was to make the viewers aware of how language evolved. The specific reason of choosing language and expanding on the psychology of language is the fact that language is very basic to human beings. Whatever we are, whatever we do in terms of cognitive processes, whether it is thinking, talking, problem solving, decision making, memory, all of these need to be communicated or need to be expressed between people and sometimes even within ourselves. And the medium through which we share these ideas among people or within ourselves also is the medium of language. So basically language is that process which is integral or very basic for cognition to develop. We may make memory traces of a four-legged animal which barks, but how do we convey to someone else of what we are thinking about and the only way that is possible is through a process of language because that is the medium through which different people will understand that we are talking about a dog. No matter the fact that these people may have different names for the same concept, for the same four legged animal which barks, but when we communicate with them, we all are able to share the same idea that I am thinking about a dog. So whether it is the German Hund or the English dog or the Hindi Kutta or the Japanese Inu, we are all talking about the same concept and that way we are all able to share the same idea and that is how basic language is. So we started out the first lecture by talking about how language developed and for that we needed to distinguish the difference between a communication and a language. So we started off by looking at what is communication and how it is different from language. So in order to understand communication, we needed to go back to the non-humans or the animals and in the first class itself, we saw how animal communications are developed, how animal communications are in nature, what are the various factors which govern animal communication, how do they progress and what are the need for animal communication. Then we moved on to look looking at special features or special needs of animal communication. We discussed how animals need a communication system for finding foods and there we elaborated the idea of the honeycomb, honeybee wangle. We looked at how animal communication is responsible for finding foe and we looked at several uh, distress calls by either the, uh, the vervet monkey or the squirrels. We looked at how animal communication is basic to finding friends and hierarchies within animal uh, systems or animal groups and how animal uh, these uh, animal vocalizations and communications, they establish attachment process within animals, so finding friends. And another reason, important reason that 
animals communicate the reason why they communicate is finding mates because that is one important reason of how the species will go further or it will breed further. Then we looked at certain general features of animal communication and that is what we did in the first part of the lecture. Further to that we needed to distinguish how human language is different from animal language or animal communication and so we started looking at the idea of human language. We saw laughter as a human language, as a social language and using laughter as a model we tried to see how animal, human languages progress. We saw how human languages are bind by certain features and what are its characteristic components of a human language. We saw in that lecture, lecture how many different forms of human language is possible. So, whether it is vocal or it is manual or it is a sign language. And we ended the lecture there by looking at something called duality of patterning. So, the basic features of how human language distinguishes from minimal communication was human languages are governed by certain rules whereas, animal languages are not. So, one of the primary features of distinguishing between the human language and uh, animal communications are this. Also, it has stru certain structured components, human language has structured components whereas, animal communications do not have structured uh, components. So, a lot cannot be expressed through animal communication systems whereas, human languages have this property where a number of information, a number of ideas can be expressed through them. Then we looked at how certain arbitrary symbols which bears no resemblance to the actual object or concept we are referring leads us to share ideas and that is one property of an, an, uh, human languages. Duality of patterning we saw is basically a property where lower units are combined with certain rules to form larger units and these larger units then are able to describe a number of ideas. Simple elements like phones, morphemes or words, letters, sentences are used to form uh, are combined through syntax to form a semantic a meaning which is expressed among people. So, basic structures or basic forms or basic elements are combined together to form larger elements and that is how if you look at a sentence, how this sentence is different from the various words. For example, the sentence the dog barks, the dog who barks in the field is a yellow dog. Now, if you look at it each word is different when it is taken alone, but when you combine together the meaning of the sentence will be different from the word itself. And so, this is what is duality of uh, the patterning where individual words are combined together to give a whole new meaning. And this duality of patterning also gives language limitless possibilities or limitless expressibilities. Human language is structured through a pyramid form. Now, this duality of uh, patterning that we have been talking about is, is uses certain basic patterns. So, what we will start today is by looking at the pyramidical structure, the pyramid structure that language follows and what are the basic elements that language is used. As I said the basic elements which combine to form language may or may not resemble the actual meaning of the sentence which is composed of the basic elements. And so, the basic elements may not express its true form in the sentence, the sentence which basically uh, corresponds to the fact the sentence would mean something else and the basic elements would mean something else. So, let us look at how the human language is structured around. So, the building blocks of human languages are something called phonemes or phones. Phones are the basic speech sound in the English language. And so, what are phones? For example, words like ba, a, da, these are the phones, these are the basic words. So, phonemes are 
the meaningless speech sounds which are fundamental building blocks of any language. So, these are the sounds which are produced by the vocal cord and as we will see in upcoming lectures where we will look at speech production, we will see how these phones are produced. Basic sounds which the vocal cord produce by vibrating is what the phones are. Now, these phones basic sounds and if you ever see a dictionary and if you see the pronunciation of any word, it is in the terms of phones that the word is written. Look at a dictionary, look at a pronunciation of any word and you will see the basic phones which are outlined there. Now, these basic sounds, they combine to form or they combine using certain rules which are called the phonological rules. So, what is phonology? Phonology is the rules for combining forms to form morphemes. What are morphemes? Which are basic units of meaning. Morph morphemes are words like noun ending ing, things like ly, so truly, true and truly, that kind of thing. So, certain words, certain phones which are combined together to form certain basic meanings. Morphemes are combinations of phonemes and so morphemes are the basic units of meaning. These are the root words, these are the suffixes and these are the prefixes. So, any root word, any suffix, any prefix of any word are the morphemes and these morphemes then combine together through certain rules which are called morphology. So, rules for combining morphemes to form words are what is morphology. So, if I have a root word and if I uh, add a morpheme into it, so true the root word and li truly the word that we are looking at. So, true is the root and li is the morpheme that I am adding to it. So, two morphemes combine together form the word truly and that is how morphemes are all about. So, morphemes then combine together using certain grammatical sequences, grammatical rules and these rules are called morphology. And then we have the words which are the minimum standalone units of a language. The words then combine together to form phrases. So, starting off we have the phonemes which are the basic speech sound. These basic speech sound combine together with each other through a certain rule which is called phonology. This phonology then combine together to form certain morphemes which are meaningless words and then multiple morphemes to combine together to form words. Morphemes are meaningless words for example, as I explained ly or ing and things like that and they form together to form words. So, our suffixes, prefixes, root words are morphemes and morphemes combine together using the signs of or rule of morphology and from there we have the words, the actual words that are talking about. Now, words they combine together to form phrases which are partial sentences, but they can stand alone. For example, Ram ran. If you look at it, Ram ran is a kind of a phrase it's called it's a noun phrase and so basically it can stand on its own. Although this is not a complete sentence, so Ram ran to the village is a complete sentence, but if I say Ram ran then itself means something, it can stand alone on its own, but it is not a complete sentence. So, that is what a phrase is and phrases they combine as sentences or phrases combine together to form sentences. So, looking at the word Ram ran to the village, Ram ran is the noun phrase to the village or Ram is the noun phrase and ran to the village is the verb phrase and if we combine together we will get a complete sentences. So, phrases are basically governed by the letters or, or the, the constraint of uh, language which, which it has and that are complete sentences. So, phrases combine together to form sentences and these sentences combine together to form the discourse or language at, as we uh, as we talk about. So, discourse is the kind of conversation that I am having. The kind of conversation, the kind of speaking that I am doing, it is composed of sentences 
and each sentence is composed of words. The words are follow, again composed of some kind of a uh, morpheme. The morpheme is composed of the phonemes, and the phonemes are composed of the uh, uh, the phonology. So let's look at this particular diagram, and if you look into it, meaningless phonemes, which are smallest unit of speech sounds, combine according to rules of phonology to form morphemes, which are the smallest uh, units of meaning. Morphemes then combine according to the rules of morphology to form words. And if you look into uh, here, the word is flying aeroplanes. Now this is a verb phrase. Flying. This is verb, and so this is a verb phrase, and so you have flying or fly in flying. Flying aeroplanes, and if you look into it, the at the level of the word we have flying aeroplanes, at the level of the morphemes we have fly, which is the root word, and ing, which is the ending, which is the suffix. So, this is my morpheme and the rule which combining it. Similarly, air is the root word, plane is the root word, and s is the ending, which is there, and so combining together aeroplanes. And at the level of phonemes, you have f, l, y, how they are pronounced, i, n, n, g, a, i, n, r, aeroplane. And so play n and z. So this is the level of this. So my phones combine together through phonology, certain rules to form morphemes, which again combine together form words. This is morphology, and this is for phonology. These are the rules. Of course, what I have done is now extended this to form, and this basically these two combine together to form the verb phrase. We again will form a sentence. So flying aeroplanes are dangerous. That's a sentence. And then I can have a discourse. So uh, it is said something, something, something. The flying aeroplanes are dangerous. That's a discourse, which is a more uh, higher level meaning of or higher level uh, in language. So how these sentences and discourse actually work? What are the rules through which they work? The, sen the sentences, the words that we have, which form sentences, actually use certain rules, which are called the syntax. What is syntax? Syntax is a set of rules for ordering words into phrases and sentences. So, the big boy ate the apples. If you look into here, the big boy is the noun phrase and ate the apple is the verb phrase. It is ate the apple can stand alone, alone on its own, the big boy can stand alone on its own and so this is the noun phrase because it is starting with a noun, this is starting with a verb and so on and so forth. And the rule that the subject verb object structure that it is following or the uh, noun verb noun pattern that it is following is what is called is called a syntax so syntax is basically the rule for ordering words into phrases and sentences if i say big the boy is not going to work so there is a particular format of using it and that's what a syntax is now this form if you look at it from a cognitive psychology perspective this way of organizing the words into sentences uses something called working memory. So short term memory, what is working memory? It is a short term memory for whatever we are currently thinking about. So if, if you look at how the phonological loop works in working memory, what happens is that when you hear a word, the central executive breaks the word into its constituent parts. For example, what is the noun, what is the verb, what is the, uh, uh, the uh, noun again, so subject and object and verb and that is what is repeated. In between, in between words, for example, conjunctions and interjunctions and uh, other words which combine or determiners, these are not what is uh, processed by the phonological loop. And because these uh, these words, these uh, 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 grammatical words which follow rules automatically are used. And so, short term memory or, or working memory just uh, loops the basic words, the basic operator words here and the operator word is the, as I said, the subject, object and verb and that is what is enough for describing any sentence. So working limited to about 7, so what is working memory? It is a short term memory of whatever we are currently thinking about and so what, what it does is it takes in information whenever you speak a certain word, these words are taken up with the working memory, the in what sequence they should appear, that, that is basically what the working memory keeps, these words they keep and out of that the meaning is generated. Also limited to about 7 plus or minus 2 items, too small to process most sentences as a whole. And so what working memory actually does is, it does not process the whole sen uh, the sentence, what it does is it looks at the operator words and the constituent words and based on that it is able to generate the whole sentence or generate meaning out of the sentence. How does it do it? It do it through the process of how it, the working memory works through the process of something called chunking. And so what is chunking? Groups of meaningless items into meaningful units 
to increase working memory capacity. And so, what it does is if you if you narrate a complete sentence, what the working memory is going to do is take out the subject, verb and object, the operator words, the connector word, the relational word and the operator words and basically then it will loop it together and later on when it is finding the sentence, it will try to bring the word order together or uh, predict the word order and from there it will be able to generate the sentence. This way it can actually group a number of, it can listen to a number of sentences. Whenever you are reading, it is not that every word that you read, you only read the operator word and relational words, that is how you read. And so, what, what it does is the working memory chunks them together, it, it, uh, it categorizes words together in terms of relational word and operator words and that is how it is able to uh, hear so many words or receive so many words and process so many words. Phrases serves as chunks allowing for sentences that exceeds working memory capacity. And so, one way of chunking is breaks the whole sentence into certain phrases, the noun phrase, the verb phrase, the participle phrase and so on and so forth. So, what is discourse? Sequence of sentences ordered according to rules which is conversation and narratives. So, what is discourse is these sentences when they are arranged through a certain rule or, or certain sequence uh, and which leads to conversations and narratives are actually what are discourse. So, the human, uh, the human language is basically built up of a hierarchical structure. Now, as we saw that working memory is responsible for uh, doing this word reading or understanding this word reading. Now, let us look at how a simple sentence, the man in the Santa Claus suit used to be my history professor is basically perceived or is basically broken. Oh, what is the rule? What is the syntax which is used for uh, uh, processing this language? So, basically what happens in human language is the rules that are there is that you have words and these words follow certain rules to form phrases and then the phrases they follow certain rules to form the sentences. These rules are exactly called the syntax and these are the phrase structure rule. So, one phrase structure rule is what we have here. As you look at the T diagram uh, for the sentence, the man in the Santa Claus suit used to be my history professor. Note the various instances of the recursion in the st uh, structure, especially nesting of the noun phrases with the noun phrases and the verb phrases within the verb phrases. Abbreviation D is determiner, N is the noun, P is the preposition, V is the verb, N P is the noun phrase, V P is the verb phrase, uh, P P is the prepositional phrase, S is the sentence and so on and so forth. So, if I look at this particular sentence, the man in the Santa Claus suit used to be my history professor, how does it actually get arranged? How does it actually get uh, built up? Now, this basic way of breaking the sentence into in constituent parts is called the phase structure rule. So, this is my complete sentence and then this sentence is broken down into its two constituent phrase. The two constituent phrase is the noun phrase and the verb phrase. My noun phrase is this part of the sentence which is the man in the Santa Claus suit. This is my noun phrase and then I have my verb phrase. Since this is the operating word, verb, if you look into it, if in the complete sentence, this is the operating verb, the word. And so, used to be my history professor is my verb phrase. So, within the noun phrase, then I have several other phrases. The man in the Santa Claus suit can be explained as following a rule in which the noun phrase, the man in Santa Claus suit can be further broken down into its constituent sentences. One way of looking at is the man is one phrase. In the Santa Claus suit, this can be one phrase in itself and within that, the Santa Claus suit itself is one phrase or I can have Santa Claus is one, one uh, phrase and so I can have, so you see this is the noun phrase this is the noun phrase. So, Santa Claus suit is one uh, noun phrase, Santa Claus is one noun phrase and within that you have the Santa Claus suit is another noun phrase and if you look at in the Santa Claus suit, it is again a noun phrase. Now, phrase meaning that uh, it can, this these group of words can stand on its own, can, ha can, can have uh, individual meaning or can stand on its own, can have some meaning. So, looking at it, then my first break or my first uh, division in this sentence is the man and if you look into it, the is the determiner because it is the first time the noun is introduced and so I am using the and man is the noun. 
So, the man can sound its own. Similarly, this noun phrase is then broken down into, into its prepositional phase, the prepositional phrase being in and then my noun phrase. So, in is the preposition which I have. So, anything following in is the prepositional phrase and from there on I have another noun phrase which has the determinant the and then the noun phrase Santa Claus suit. Now, even the Santa Claus suit can be broken down into its two noun the Santa Claus and then I have the suit. So, it is three noun and that is how it is broken. Similarly, my worst word phrase starts with a verb used to be as it is known. And so, if you look into it, this verb phrase is then broken down into ver, uh, a verb prepositional phrase because to is a preposition that I am using here. And so, to the use to, right? And then this to is again broken down into another verb phrase, which is since be, as I said, to be is another verb, which is there. So, be my host, to be my history of, uh, uh, professor. So, be, and within that, I have a noun phrase which has a determiner mind, and then a noun phrase we have two nouns history professor. And so, that is how the whole sentence is broken down. So, it has basically noun phrases, verb phrases, participle, uh, prepositional phrases and that is how the sentence is broken. And so, this was just to give you an idea of how grammar really works or the rules of grammar in forming a sentence actually works. So, basically then discourse is the language structure consisting of sentences that are ordered according to a particular rule. Now, while animal communication systems are always about here and now, they talk about things which are here and so if you saw the wiggle dance or the call uh, that vervet monkeys were actually doing, they were talking about things which are here and now. But human language systems talk about future and can talk about past and that is one another thing, interesting thing. Human language, they allow us to talk about events which happened in the past or other uh, at other times and places and this basically is called the displacement principle and that is not common with animal systems. So, the ability to refer to things and events beyond here and now is a property which is only present in the human language. Also animal communication systems generally lack displacement, animal communication system can talk only about here and now. At the very basic, if you look at the, hun, uh, the honey bee wiggle dance, it can talk about a little bit from the past where it tells the other bees of where it is from the past, it has found the, uh, the reserve of um, the honey, but that is the all it can do. Much of human language uses it, uh, use, uh, is about here and now. Now, structural comp complexity of a language allows communication about, so this displacement or the structural complexity of human language allows about to talk about events in other location, for example, down by the river. So, it basically says that somewhere else, the event that I am talking about is not happening here and now it is happening somewhere else at some other place by some other thing. Similarly, events on other times, the other day, when I am talking about the other day, it means that some event in the past that, that has happened to me or hypothetical events, for example, if I were you, so this kind of thing. Uh, the animals communication systems cannot talk about, but human communication systems can very well do that. And so, I am talking about a hypothetical situation, a future situation where me becomes you kind of a position is there, where I can think about where I am proposing something which is not possible. So, how did human language or language for that matter evolve? And so, in this section what we will do is we will describe the evolutionary family tree of modern human language and its related uh, uh, concepts. We will look at concepts of the recursions which are believed to be how complex languages actually um, propagated or started. We will look at the continuity and discontinuity theories of language evaluation for there are two basic theories. One says that language has evolved over a period of time slowly. The discontinuity theory says that language evolved from uh, one. Uh, uh, modification or one iteration from their language evolve very rapidly and then we will discuss the key aspects of social theories of language evolution. So, very quickly how did language evolve? It is believed that uh, the Homo erectus which is 1.8 million years, uh, some 200, uh, 200,000 years ago they developed and uh, first human like creatures to walk upright using fire and stone tools. So, they had a language. So, humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor which is the Homo erectus and they share a common, uh, the Homo erectus was an ancestor for both uh, the Nindanthals and the modern 
humans. So, Homo nudentils, which are 200,000 to 5 to 50,000 years ago, they are descendant of Homo erectus and parallel species of early humans. Now, the languages that these um, the animals were using was a kind of a proto language. So, it is kind of a uh, a pseudo language which can express meaning, but not the form in which we can do, uh, which uh, the modern human beings can do. Now, Homo sapiens they were 200,000 years ago to the present, and modern uh, humans only surviving uh, are Homo sapiens. So, common ancestors are the humans, gorilla, chimpanzees, and bobons descended from a common ancestor some 6 million years ago, and they are no longer extant today. So, humans evolved following evolution, following the evolutionary ladder. So, we started with Homo uh, erectus, then Homo nethels, then Homo sapiens and from there the human beings, uh, they moved uh, through the ladder of uh, uh, the selection of species and we evolved from there. Now, species do not evolve from one another, it is generally believed that species do not evolve from one another, uh, rather populations that were once a uh, single species, they split into two and these two adapt to newer environments forming newer species. So, if you look here approximate family for the hominid li uh, lineage and these are what it is. So, you, this is the common ancestor that we all had uh, and some uh, 6000 thousand years ago and then within the 5000 thousand years uh, we have this gorilla coming up and then the chimpanzees and there is a break here uh, within the 400,000 period and so you do not see any development, we do not know what happened in between here and then the bonobo was uh, along this period only the development and this period has nothing. Then we have the Neanderthal men and the hum modern humans and the Homo erectus and the present is what we have the modern human and the common ancestors are these two although uh, gorillas and chimpanzees are also common ancestors for both of these. Now, how this language developed is another, so one way uh, that this language developed by, was that single species split into uh, two and many species and they adapted to new environments giving to rise to different languages. Also interbreeding reveals that if two populations are from the same species and so they develop interbreeding was another reason with another confirmatory reason that one single species they moved to different locations and, and uh, that lead led to different languages being uh, developed. Human erectus was the first successful species. So, 200,000 years ago Homo sapiens arrived and then the thales arrived around 400,000 years ago. Similarly, 50,000 years ago the stone age uh, we had the African Homo sapiens and by 400, 4000 years ago the, the Neanderthals in Europe they uh, arose. And so, basically this is the chart of how uh, hum, uh, human beings evolved from uh, the, the, the chimpanzees and gorillas and how language would have been, uh, how language would have been uh, processed or progressed. Now, one of the interesting thing in the evolution of language or one of the interesting properties of language is the property of uh, the recursion. Recursion is a basic property of language and what is uh, recursion? Recursion or the process of extending a pattern by placing it in, its, in inside itself is an important feature of human language in particularly a human thought in general. So, basically this property says that we take a particular thought or we take a particular uh, uh, pattern and we keep on placing the pattern within itself and that is how the language actually extends or ang language actually develops. If you look into here uh, the, the way I explained to you, so if you look into here there is noun phrase and there is the prepositional phrase, again we have noun phrase. So, within the sentence I have the noun phrase, the verb phrase and within the noun phrase I have the noun phrase and the prepositional phrase and the noun phrase and so you, uh, what you see here is the recur uh, the recursion that is there a particular way, a particular uh, format or a, a particular pattern is taken and is repeated with, uh, within itself and that causes language to flow. So, basically what is recursion then let us have a look at. The process of extending a pattern by placing in itself is basically what is called recursion. Now, this is you can see this very common in the structure of DNA or in flower, flower pattern arrangements and, and so on and uh, so forth. So, basically what happens is if you look at if you ever uh, look at the 
uh, cauliflower what you actually see is that the same pattern actually keeps on extending and to various limits or if you look at leaves they have the same pattern and so that's what is uh, the idea of recursion it is the same pattern that I have the same basic structure it is re being repeated uh, again and again and that for forms the complex structure which is out there. Now, uh, in mathematics, this is explained in terms of counting for n, n equals to 1 is basically always n 0 plus 1. So, n if there is any, any number n, it will always have a number n plus 1 which is greater than 8 and it will have the same n and this is the recursion. For example, if you look at 1, 2 and 3, 2 will always have 1 and 1 which is added together and 3 will have 2 and 1 one way or it could have 1, 1 and 1. So, the basic structure 1 is what is being repeated and so this is what is called uh, the recursion policy. In terms of language, you have the syntax for example, uh, you have the sentence, each sentence is combined of several sentences. For example, look at these sentences. So, this kind of things with uh, children uh, play with to make larger sentences. For example, look here, I saw the dog and then somebody adds another that chased the cat, that caught the rat, that ate the cheese and so the sentence will be never uh, ending. I can make a never ending sentences with this kind of a recursion. What I do is some basic pattern, a noun phrase, a verb phrase or some other phrase is taken and it is repeated inside an, uh, the, with recursions with so many iterations and that is how language is actually made up of. Now, this particular thing is very akin to the idea of Russian dolls. If you have ever seen Russian dolls, now it uh, and these are known as the Matryoshka which provides a concrete example for re uh, recursion. If you have seen this, you will, oh, if, you, if you travel, if you are in uh, Moscow or somewhere near there, you, you get a, uh, a porcelain um, a doll kind of a thing and so the idea is, is, is the doll within a doll. So, you will have a similar, this doll is similar to this doll only smaller in shape and so you will have the smallest doll. So, it is doll within a doll kind of a structure. So, each doll resembles the other but one fits inside another. Uh, those inside the third and so on and so forth. Likewise, in language, we can nest sentences into each other and this is a unique aspect of human language as in a communication system. So, we need not have multiple uh, parts of it, we need not have multiple uh, versions of it, we can nest the same sentence or we can nest the same phrases, same, same pattern and form a language or a medium of communication. Now, according to Noam Chomsky, 2011, Recursion is the key to understanding how human language evolved from the primitive structures. So, if you want to see, Noam Chomsky believes that if somebody wants to see how languages have actually evolved from primitive structure, the basic answer to that lies in terms of recursion. The recursion is the way which shows how primitive or proto languages that, that the chimpanzee have, how they progress into the way the present languages. So, Chomsky emphasizes the centrality of syntax concept and which is uh, here the ability to organize words into phrases and sentences according to recursive rules. So, Chomsky believes the language evolution happens through centrality of syntax. Now, views that ability to organize words into phrases and sentences according to recursive rule is the distinguishing feature of language. So, basically what Chomsky believes is the centrality of syntax is basically one of the uh, primitive evidences that how language would have evolved. Now, Chomsky what they uh, propose is recursion is the key to understanding evolution of language also single mutation transferred uh, transform human uh, uh, pre-human brain into a recursive thinking machine and that is what Chomsky believes. Now, the question whether human languages evolve gradually or rapidly is known as the continuity debate. Another thing that that is there is the continuity de debate. Now, full monster hypothesis what it believes is the idea that a single mutation can lead to a rapid transition of species and the continuity debate is did human languages evolve gradually or uh, rapidly. Now, on one end we have the continuity debate which, which believes that whether language would have uh, evolved uh, continuously through a progress uh, through progress of uh, uh, basic language structures or rapidly through one uh, one mutation of a language and one mutation of uh, a gene would have produced a different brain and the recursive idea of language would have developed a language evidences for this country there is a discontinuity theory also and this evidences for discontinuity theory believes that there is a specific lam language impairment in uh, the ke family so basically language evolution so whether language evolved out of continuity or discontinuity, which basically means that whether language evolved slowly or fast from uh, uh, proto languages 
from basic languages and through recursive properties it, it, it came to the present form which is there or the discontinuity th uh, theory believes that there was one simple mutation, there was one basic mutation and because of this mutation the whole language system developed. It is not recursive in language, it is not slow or fast, it is not progressive and so the evidence that the discontinuity theory places uh, uh, that language is not continuous in nature, it is not uh, developed uh, out of a continuous process and the, then the, the evidences that they provide is uh, the specific language manipulation of the KE family. Now, the KE family evidence which says that ex extended family living in London with a genetic language disorder. So, uh, one group of uh, psycholinguists they looked at this family and what this family had is a specific language disorder and this language disorder was not actually uh, happening due to uh, any brain damage. What was happening is a particular gene was uh, uh, mutating in, in, in a way uh, and because of this mutation every species or every member of that family was facing the same problem and so basically they provide this evidence for the discontinued theory which states that language did not progress as a uh, or language did not develop as a progressive steps, it developed out of a discontinuity function. So, at one point of time a single mutation happened and because of that language developed. It is not a rec recursive feature, it is not a progressive feature which uh, Noam Chomsky believes it to be. Now, specific language impairment, language disordered <coughs> not attributable to brain damage or hearing losses. And they found something called a Fox P2 gene, with the gene that plays a role in brain development and so they found out that this gene was the mutation uh, or mutation in this gene was what the disorder was happening in this particular family. Now, KE family members with normal language have normal versions while with SLI have deficiencies version. So, some P, some uh, this FOX2, FOX P2 gene in the KE family, those members of the KE family which had the normal gene was having normal languages, but those uh, members of the uh, family which were having a mutated gene, they had this defective version. Now, has a high, uh, it is a wide ranging influences on embryonic development and not specific to any language. Later on it was found out there is this FOX P2 gene was not the reason how language would have developed or this continuity theory uh, is not the uh, may not be the uh, right theory for proposing how language would have evolved. Now, on the other hand, on one hand we have these uh, discontinuity theory which says that with single mutations language would have uh, evolved, it is not a continuous process, it is not an evolutionary process, it is not a recursive process through which uh, language has developed. On the other hand we have the evidences with the continuity theory. The continuity theory uh, says that these theories are consistent with the principles of natural selection. So, continuity theory is steady transition from animal communication system to uh, language and so these theory says that language development is continuous and it's, it's, it became uh, either rapid or um, slow. This developed through a process of continuous evaluation or continuous uh, uh, regeneration of the language, continuous development of the language. As a rule, evolution is continuous, not abrupt and so they believe, the continuity theories believe that language developed as a continuous process on a continuum. The discontinuity theories believes that sudden transitions from animal communication to human language has been there and no language species had inter intermediate communication ability. So, there was no uh, in intermediate communication ability between people. The existence of Pidgin which are uh, kind of languages uh, which is not a true language. For example, Pidgins are languages which uh, when two uh, group of people who speak different language they come together and they want to share ideas between them they develop a language which is called a Pidgin. So, when the English people went to China they had gold and silvers and the Chinese had a market of porcelain and tea and they the Chinese did not understand the English people, the English people did not understand the Chinese people, but they developed a medium of communication among themselves and this medium of communication is a good example of Pidgin. So, what are Pidgins? Pidgins are form of languages which are uh, very basic, so it is a very basic form of language and they have very few um, uh, what to say, uh, expressions very few words and through which express uh, uh, language is expressed. For example, no can do. If you look at this, this is a kind of language, uh, one day, uh, two day, three day, going today, going yesterday, that kind of a thing is, is a, a example of Pidgin. So, one evidence for the continuity theory is the evolution of Pidgins and the existence of Pidgins which suggests that the possibility that pre-human spo uh, spoke a proto-language halfway between animal calls and a 
full language. So the Pidgin, the existence of Pidgin or the generation of Pidgins as a language system basically gives provides enough evidences that uh, the basic human, the uh, pre, uh, primitive humans uh, spoke a primitive language which is called the proto language and from there the natural language that we presently speak has evolved. So, what are Pidgins then? Pidgins as I said are simple languages of few hundred words and are very basic grammar and emerge naturally when speakers of different languages need to communicate, right. Also, the Cyril is another form of um, uh, language which is there. So, the children of people who speak Pidgin, they develop a fully developed Pidgin uh, syntax which is called a Cyril. So, it is a full fledged language based on a Pidgin. Children of Pidgin speakers flesh it out as a full language and transition takes place only in one generation. And so, this, this is the evidence for uh, the fact that uh, uh, languages actually uh, uh, follow a continuity theory or language uh, language productions were continuous. Now, Proto language, proto language is the language that it is uh, the continuity theory believes that uh, primitive humans used to speak. How is this? It is a hypothetical pidgin line language spoken by ancestral humans. Uh, Big turn 1990 proposed that animal com communication was pre homo erectus, uh, proto language was homo erectus, and full language were developed by homo sapiens. Similarly, proto language as continuity theory, chimpanzees in the wild do not use uh, pidgin, but they can be taught pidgin in the lab. So, uh, several experiments have been done with chimpanzees and they were taught this pidgin language. The pidgin language is basically as I said, it is a very basic language with cert certain kind of words to express certain kind of ideas. So, they are not full fledged language, no grammar, no no perfect grammar, no perfect syntax. Or uh, human transitions from pidgin to serial in one generation is also. Uh, the reason for or the, also the evidence for the debate of continuity theories. Now, there are certain social theories of language evolution uh, besides the continuity discontinuity theory and what this theory says mother tongue hypothesis. What is the mother tongue hypothesis? Language evolved from maternal vocalizations that took on meaning over many generations. So, social language theories of evolution says that the special nature of mother infant interactions lead to the development of uh, the language which is there. The, the relation between music and speech is another evidence which, which, which is there and the role of conversation in building and maintaining social relationships are the reason for uh, this kind of uh, social learning theory. Now, singing and the hypothesis both music and language evolve from vocalizations of pre-human social interactions and so the singing Nendethel uh, um, hypothesis states that language and music they evolve from vocalizations of pre-human social interactions. So, basically then uh, at one basic level both music and language are the same and then they diverge because at the level of divergence where they are connecting together this is where they are coming from Nendethel's also uh, social grooming hypothesis what it says is the gossip for humans serves the same purpose as social network building for the grooming of chimpanzees. And so, uh, social hy uh, grooming hypothesis is another hypothesis which says that there is a continuity theory, there is a continuous ways in which language are developed. Also social theories emphasizes social aspects of language use rather than specific language evolution and challenge tradition view of language as thought to be a transmission. So, basically then there is a social learning theory of language which says that the certain kind of evidences from the social structure from the social high grooming hypothesis and mother infant relationship suggest that language came as a social development. Uh, there are other theories which are the continuity and the discontinuity theory which says that either language developed in, in a continuous form or language developed out of one mutation, one single mutation and uh, through there the whole of language actually developed. And so, uh, we come to the point where we actually have uh, to, to say uh, to make you understand how uh, living fossils are there or what is the uh, evidence for the fact that uh, languages have developed from uh, the primitive uh, uh, animals that is there. And so, one of the evidences are characteristics of Pidgin have in common. If you look at Pidgins, the very fact that how languages which are developed uh, in, in uh, basic animals, how they are the reason for the development of the language that we have. Uh, in explanation to that, uh, we will look at what characteristics. So, since Pidgin is the most ba basic language, we, we have evidences that most P Pidgins have a common characteristic and that basically points out the fact that languages evolved from a common point from the nin, uh, either uh, the Homo erectus or that kind of a thing. So, basically this, this proves that there was a proto language and from there the whole of language came in. And so, one evidence for that is that uh, Pid, most Pidgins have a common uh, 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 common characteristics. So, Pidgins are simplified languages, but they are very useful for 
communication uh, when no common languages are av uh, available. And so, uh, most Pidgins have a simple phonology, for example, them and their, them, their or business is Pidgin. So, ba Pidgin basically is believed to be the Chinese word for business. So, uh, so one characteristic of P Pidgin is that it has simple phonology. So, what is Pidgin? First of all, it is a, a simplified language, uh, but they are useful uh, for communication when no common language is there. Also, they suggest that an intermediate step between animal communication systems and full-fledged human uh, language is evolutionary viable. So, Pridgin gives the reason that there, there is an evolutionary step or there is a uh, there is a step where animal communication and human communication, this is the link between the animal communication and the human communication. Also, one generation transitions from Pridgin to serial lends some has sup uh, support to discontinuity theory. Now, all Pidgins have some common characteristics. First, they have the same phon phonology as we are looking at them and there. And if you look at it here, this is the phonology which is which is out there. So, th replaced by d. In this case, the th they are replaced by d here. Also, they generally lack a morphology. Most Pidgins don't have a morphology. For example, single and plural. If you look into it, one man, two men, go today, go yesterday. Whatever you look into it, there is no morphology as such. And then they have limited uh, vocabularies. Most uh, Pidgins have limited vocabularies. Mostly content words are there. You have the noun words, few functional words. For example, a is of the. These are the uh, basic words that you will have. Then. Most Pidgins, they have little or no syntax. Uh, example, they are short sentences, reliance on context for determining the syntactic role. So, the uh, word order is free. So, uh, going one man or one man going, one man eating, that kind of a thing. So, word order is not fixed. As in English language, you have the subject, verb and object. This word order, word order is not fit, uh, fixed in the Pidgin. And also, effortful to produce. Nobody speaks Pidgin as a native language. And so, they require some effort to produce. Now, so basically, Pidgin is uh, is one uh, uh, evidence that languages actually evolved from the, the lower ev level animals, for example, gorillas, chimpanzees, and and and, and uh, that kind of proto humans, and uh, they developed a proto language, and that led to the development of complicated complex languages that we have today. Now, early attempts to teach speech to primates they failed because they lacked the vocal tract structure uh, required to produce full range of speech sound. And so, early attempts to teach uh, languages to uh, apes, uh, Gua did that in uh, Kellogg and uh, Kellogg 1993 raised chimpanzee infants along with their own infant and they failed uh, to learn words by 18 months unlike human uh, infant. So, after 18 months, they failed to learn words. Also, Wiki, Hayes and Hayes 1922 raised chimpanzee infants as humans and they learned only four words after three years, whereas their own ch child could uh, produce <coughs> unlimited vocabulary by three years. Now, the reason for that is vocal uh, uh, tract, system of air passages with throat, mouth and, now, um, mouth and nose, where speech is produced. This is not present in chimpanzees and that is one reason why they cannot produce the, the speech sound which is there. Also, chimpanzees vocal tract does not allow for articulation of speech and that is the why, reason why early chimpanzees or early studies on chimpanzees were not successful. Later, uh, attempts were done to teach chimpanzees particular languages and so Coco was one. Peterson 1978 trained gorillas in American sign languages and so active vocabulary about 1000 words and noble combination but that is the best they, they could do. Similarly, Kanji was a chimpanzee. So, Savage, Romberg and colleagues 1998, they trained Bonobo to a communication with visual systems called lexigrams and so these Bonobo, they learned, uh, Kanji learned a uh, lot of languages or a lot of words and uh, sentence, uh, uh, word meanings, but they could never produce the sentence or the kind of complexity that language requires. Also, spoken English comprehension similar to two year old could be generated was able to, uh, these uh, Savage and Romberg was able to generate with the Kanji, but that is the best they could do. What is, but is it language? So, Pidgin like structures, uh, little evidence of a syntax and utterances are communicative and socially engaging. So, the kind of thing that these people were doing by teaching uh, animals, uh, the basic question is what that language, why? Because they had little syntax and they could produce certain words, they can utter certain words, uh, the, the words utterance was very limited and so they had no meaning as such. Also, utterances are communicative and socially engaging.
So how does then, uh, let's look at how babies talk and let's look at how evolution of language happens in, in humans. So 0 to 12 months, the vocalization babbling gradually becoming language like. By 12 to 18 months, most babies uh, could produce few dozen words uh, which are generally hollow phrases, so complete phrases. By 18 to 24 months, they begin of voc uh, vocabulary spurt, word leaning at a, rap a rapid pace and two word utterances, between like structure happens by 18 to 24 months and by 24 to 48 months, vocabulary and syntax develop approaching an adult language model. Children like uh, children language develop suggest trajectory similar to the language evolution which is holophrases leading to pidgin leading to syntax. So basically uh, how it is proposed that language develop is first children they learn holophrases and then they learn the basic sentences. So uh, uh, mother drink or baby drink or mother smile that kind of a pidgin and then there is a syntax so mother will drink I will drink water and that kind of a syntax followed languages followed. Now, language loss. Obviously, we looked at how language develops, but then there are other problems also uh, or there are other uh, brain uh, uh, states or, or, or the, the loss of language. Let us look at how loss of languages are there, what are the kind of losses of language and what they uh, signify. So, we have aphasia which is language deficit due to the brain damage. So, if you have a deficit in the brain, uh, on particularly in the Broca or the uh, vertical area that leads to aphasia which is the deficit of a language. Now, you have two kinds of aphasia, you have the Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. So, let us look at Broca area, Broca area is a, a language area and also Wernicke area is a language area. So, what is Broca's aphasia? Characterized by disjointed ungrammatical speech. So, people will be able to speak, but they will be uh, able to speak disjointed sentences which has no grammar as such. So, fine language speaking, but then it has no grammatical structure. Effortful language production, you will not be able to produce, you will be able to produce language with, with greater efforts. Pidgin like mostly content words, few functional words, affect spoken, written and sign language. So, these are the uh, basic uh, things. So, you will be able to produce pidgin like mostly content words, there are few functional words out of it and it will affect spoken, written and sign languages. So, Broca's area, the brain regions, left frontal lobe that plays a role in speech production, organizing language and hierarchical structure, this is where the Broca area is and this is what leads to uh, the uh, Broca's aphasia and uh, this is where the Broca's aphasia is there. Also, there is something called Wernicke's aphasia. In Wernicke's aphasia, what you tend to do is that you are able to produce uh, language in fluent ways, but then it has no meaning. So, when uh, when the meaning of a language, uh, the language that somebody is producing, it is devoid of meaning, it is Wernicke's aphasia, but if you are not able to produce language as well, it, it is basically Broca's aphasia. And so, that brings uh, us to the conclusion of this particular session uh, that we have had. And so, we will do a little recap of what we did in this particular session. So, we started off by looking at how human languages progress and what is the uh, the, the pyramid structure of human language, how uh, basic structures uh, uh, they combine together with each other to form the basic sentence. From there on, we moved on to uh, looking at the idea of how uh, sentences and discourse uh, are, are there and what is discourse and what is sentence and what is the phase structure rule in sentence. We looked at the properties of discourse and we looked at uh, how displacement really uh, works for humans and it does not work for animal communication system. Then we looked at the evolution of language, how um, uh, uh, languages evolve over the period of years and then we uh, looked at the idea of recursion which is the modern view of how human language has evolved. We looked at Chomsky's idea of centrality of syntax and other ideas which basically produce the fact that language is uh, is continuous. And we also looked at discontinuity theories which basically say that <coughs> language evolved out of one particular uh, language was not evolution of language was not um, in, in a sequence from proto language to uh, to pidgins to complex languages. Discontinuity theory believes that languages evolved out of one spurt and so we looked at the Fox Pro uh, 2 gene, the disparity between animal communication and lingual language and these evidences which, uh, which proposes the uh, uh, the idea of discontinuity theory. We also looked at evidences of continuity theory which are uh, 
how uh, the natural selection and language production uh, the centrality syntax suggests that language is 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 uh, uh, more or less uh, developed in a gradual sense the uh, the existence of pidgin suggests that language is uh, more or less developed from proto languages and so this gives an idea that it is continuous in language also social learning theories provide a good uh, support to the continuity of languages then we saw how pidgins uh, the existence of pidgins and kesol and kesol these uh, led to the fact that languages uh, how uh, they developed from the earlier uh, humans that we have. Uh, we looked at how pidgins, uh, there are characteristic in between all pidgins and how pidgins are the um, basic structure or the midway between the proto language, the holophrases the, and, and the development of the actual language. We looked at attempts to teaching how chimpanzees, how uh, they worked and they support the fact that language was a gradual development and how it actually developed from uh, the basic chimpanzees and, and our, our ancestors and how they came to us. And so, uh, and lastly we saw how uh, aphasias or, uh, or how uh, when you have certain uh, brain damage, how they can uh, affect the language loss or what kind of language losses are there. So, in all in the uh, uh, these two sessions what we have done is we have looked at how language has uh, developed, what is uh, animal communication system, what is a human communication system or human languages, how they are different, how they have evolved and what are the basic evidences that they have evolved either in the one spurt or they have evolved over a gradual period of time and we have taken evidences from around the the world and we have tried to look at how does the, how has language evolved or what is the way in which language is, um, uh, uh, is what is the way in which we should be uh, looking at the progression of language. Now, in the upcoming lecture that we have, the uh, second, uh, the third lecture, we will look at the science of studying language, we will focus on those uh, methods through which language is studied and we will look into several other uh, aspects of uh, language and uh, the methodology is the tools that are used for studying language. So, uh, up till we do that from here it is goodbye, thank you.